Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session on an introductory approach to menopause with Deborah Forsyth. I'm Georgia, I'm the editor of Aesthetic Medicine. Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for joining us. I'm just gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so for the best experience on the platform, please make sure you're using the latest version of Google Chrome. Um, everyone watching. If you have any questions during the session, if you could just pop them in the chat box on the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little red um, message bubble icon. If you make sure you're on the this page tab, pop any questions for Deborah in there. And then after the session, we will be going over to the Aesthetic Practice Networking Lounge, where I will ask Deborah your questions. And if there's anything else that comes up, you can also ask her directly yourself. So, Thank you again, Deborah, for joining us. Um, I know you have some points that you're going to talk through with us. If you want to just give yourself a little bit of an intro first, I think that would be great for everyone. Thank you, Georgia. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session with me, Deborah Forsyth, on the history of menopause. For those of you who haven't met me before, I have been involved in medical aesthetics for over 20 years, maybe a bit more as well. Um, I've had several clinics throughout the UK and been fortunate enough to be involved in education in dermal fillers and botulinum toxins for a very long time. I got into the speciality of menopause primarily because having grown with my patients for many many years as you do when you get to understand a lot about your patients as Anna was saying beforehand they were talking about symptoms that they were having and experiencing during menopause. And at the same time, I was going through my menopause. And what I realized is that there is very little general information and education around that transphase, that transphase of menopause. Mostly because we still are very much living in a culture where it's unacceptable for anybody over the age of about 45 to put up their hand and say, yeah. I am over 45 and I'm going through menopause. It still has a huge taboo. So my goal is to educate and inform as many women as I possibly can about what menopause is and what can be done about it. So I haven't got a PowerPoint presentation. I've just decided to talk and give you a history of menopause, what to look out for, the signs and symptoms, and a little bit of psychology about the background. So thank you. So the history of menopause. In some respects, you know, it's a really fairly recent phenomenon. Women used to die long before they're old enough to experience menopause. Until the end of the Roman Empire in 1453, the normal lifespan for a woman was around about 23 years. Pregnancy and childbirth were life-threatening events, and many women didn't make it to the end of their reproductive years. In the early 19th century, not that long ago, when an occasional woman didn't live long enough to experience menopause, but then some of them did, the ones who did were commonly incarcerated for exhibiting signs of menopause. People and the medical fraternity thought she was going crazy. There are multiple words that actually reflect this. The Greek word for uterus is hysteria. That's why the name for surgical removal of the uterus is hysterectomy. There's always the word hysterical, which literally means emotional suffering, along with histrionic and hysteria. And these were the phrases that were used to describe women going through a menopausal phase at the turn of the century. But by the year 1900, there had been very, very little research done on menopause, even though at that time, women routinely lived long enough to be menopausal. However, at the same time, the entire medical community consisted of men. Male physicians shrugged off menopause as a state of mind. One physician, Robert A. Wilson, in his book, Feminine Forever in April, 1966, dared to suggest that menopause was an estrogen deficiency disease. And I'm saying 1966, his research started in the 1960s. And just think guys, that is not very long ago. But he proposed that women should take estrogen to replace the deficiency, just as insulin replaces insulin deficiency in diabetes. Whilst his theory was good, the book turned out to be part of a marketing campaign by a pharmaceutical company to boost the sales of a contraceptive pill in the mid-60s. But 
he was still ahead of his time and women did not receive estrogen placement for menopause until the late 1990s. By and large, the collective attitude of menopause is one of denial. Women just don't want to acknowledge that it's an unavoidable part of a long lifespan. Instead of celebrating the fact that we get to live long enough to experience menopause, women dread it so much that they don't prepare for it, they don't get educated about it or even talk about it. There are many illogical symptoms of menopause. In addition to the physical symptoms, there are many psychological symptoms as well. While some of them have a basis in the hormonal changes that occur, the major component stems from the way in which menopause is perceived. A negative attitude towards menopause is associated with more severe symptoms. How women see their body image plays a huge role in the attitude to menopause. So the degrees of distress can be attributed largely to attitude. Common psychological symptoms of menopause can include anxiety, inability to cope, lack of confidence, panic attacks, feelings of aggression, feelings of being lost, feelings of being invisible to their family and to friends, and this huge sense of doom that for some people is an enormous problem. In addition to the personal experience of menopause, there are many societal issues that affect what type of menopause each woman will experience. Menopause also creates a sandwich generation where many women who are still at home with young adults and parents who have become dependent on them. And this all seems to happen at a time when their bodies are changing in the same and significant way as it did when they were in puberty. The time you spend in your menopausal phase of life ranges from one third to one half of your entire life. On average, menopause starts around about the age of 50 to 51. Given that these days we are commonly living well into our 80s and 90s, that represents a long phase of life as a postmenopausal woman. Menopause marks the last phase of your life. Once you are menopausal, you are menopausal for the rest of your life. Menopause is much more than a minor event in our lives and deserves special attention. It isn't fair to you or to me or any of your family members if you just gloss over it because it's the most important part of your female cycle. So what actually happens during menopause? Well, Menopause is the process during which you transition from reproductive to the non-reproductive phase of your life. The best way to understand menopause is to use puberty as an analogy. Menopause can be understood best as puberty in reverse. So in the next set, I'm just going to talk about hormones because hormones are the key to how we function as women and how we pass through our phases of puberty, that mid-stage of life, and then perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. So each hormone has its own personality and plays a role in the menopausal experience. Number one, and the one that we're most familiar with, is estrogen. Estrogen is the female hormone. It's the hormone that makes our skin soft, our voice pitch high, our features dainty, breasts more prominent than that of a male. Despite the fact that we tend to think of it as a reproductive hormone, it's much more than that. Every cell of our bodies is dependent on estrogen. It, affa it affects the way that we think, it affects the way that we feel, it affects how we look. It contributes greatly to our general good health. It helps our other bodily functions behave in a controlled manner. But when menopause begins, our estrogen levels drop to nearly zero. Now, estrogen isn't just one component. There are three types of estrogen within the human female. We have estriom. This is the type that's present in our bodies postmenopausally. It's a weaker form of estrogen and one that our body can convert to other forms of estrogen. Then we have estradiol. 
both males and females produce estradiol. It's the most common in women in the reproductive years. And the third one is estriol. Estriol rises during pregnancy, and it's the one that helps the uterus to grow and prepares the body for delivery. The next um, hormone that most of us are fully aware of is progesterone. So the two hormones that most women understand in their bodies is estrogen and progesterone. And that tends to be because when you go into that part of your life when you have periods, you understand that estrogen has an, has an effect on your body and progesterone. And both of those in combined efforts make up the 28 days of your cycle. So progesterone is the hormone that enables you to maintain a pregnancy. Most women think of progesterone as one of their two female hormones, and whilst it is, progesterone really doesn't belong to us. Progesterone is the baby's hormone. The only reason we produce progesterone is to support a pregnancy. The literal translation of progesterone is pro, which equals for, gest, which is for gestation, and own, which means hormone, progesterone. It has a calming sedative effect on our bodies, just the perfect thing for producing a healthy baby. And in order to function as the supporting hormone of our pregnancy, progesterone has to function in partnership with estrogen during your menstrual cycle, as I mentioned before. Estrogen and progesterone have a predictable and coordinated pattern throughout our menstrual cycle. Just after the period ends, estrogen rises steadily over the first half of your cycle, peaking at mid-cycle, which is anything from about 10 to 15 day period of time, depending on the length of your period. And progesterone doesn't begin to rise until mid-cycle. So you've got estrogen that's going up and holding, and then you've got progesterone, which is rising. And it peaks about a week before you're going to have your period. And when you start menstruating, it drops suddenly to very low levels. So it has, there are quite definite behavior patterns of those two hormones within the menstrual cycle. So why does progesterone dump at that period of time? Well, to put it simply, estrogen thickens the lining of the uterus. Progesterone stabilizes that thick lining. Why do we know that? Because it is there to enable a fertilized egg to bury into the wall of the uterus in order for it to grow. So both of those hormones are very utmost within the female body from the age of puberty until the age of postmenopausal. One of the other hormones that's less popular but still plays a big part in menopause is oxytocin. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. It's the hormone that makes you fall in love, adore your children and want to keep everyone happy. So for those of you who are still with, with ladies here or still at that age, you know, mums around the house, they want to make sure that everybody's living well and being healthy and safe. You get to school on time, home from time, the husband has all that sort of stuff going on. They want to do that because of the high levels of oxytocin. All that changes whenever you go into menopause because your oxytocin level drops. And I'm sure everybody's got an anecdotal tale of the miserable woman who's in menopause. She just doesn't care about anybody, starts looking after herself. Well, that may be true because physiologically that's what's happened, but it's something that's not within her control. So um, it's also the hormone that makes women become really quite sad when it drops in, in older age. But, you know, that's part of the life and part of the life stream that we have to take into consideration when we're dealing with these patients and take paths and options of how to make that less acute for them. One of the other hormones that's relevant in menopause, as it is throughout our puberty stage, is FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone. This is the hormone that's produced in the brain and acts on our ovaries. And it's what causes our ovaries to produce estrogen, and eggs. The other hormone is luteinizing hormone and it's the hormone that is produced in our brain again and acts on the ovary to produce progesterone. Both follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone fluctuate through your menstrual cycle and are very effective during the perimenopausal phase of your menopause. Because menopause is a process that takes place over time, 
rather than being a sudden event, we use specific terms to distinguish the progressive phase of the process. The phases refer to the timeframes before, during, and after the menopausal transition takes place. The first phase is the pre-menopause phase. And this refers to the phase before menopause. Premenopausal women are those who are still having monthly cycles, not yet experiencing the signs or symptoms of menopause. So actually, when we put it into a time frame, premenopausal women pretty much start from puberty because we're finding more and more these days that we're having much younger women who are having an early menopause. The earliest one I've heard of recently is a young lady of 29 and she's fully gone through her menopause already. So she was definitely in a premenopausal state from the day she started puberty. Perimenopause is the one that most people are commonly familiar with. And this refers to the transition time between premenopause and postmenopause. Just as puberty takes place over a period of time of many months or years, so does the process of menopause. Perimenopause includes the time from the first sign or symptom of menopause until the time menopause is fully established. During this time, you may have some or all of the symptoms of menopause. They may be intermittent or they may be continuous. For some women, this phase may persist up to 20 years. That's the extreme number. The average period of time for most people in perimenopause is around about five to 10 years. Then we go into what's happening. Perimenopause is the result of a drop in your levels of progesterone. Low level progesterone is the first hormonal change to begin the transition into menopause. This produces an imbalance of the ratio of estrogen to progesterone, resulting in a temporary excess of estrogen or something that we call estrogen dominance. And when you're talking about menopausal women and how to treat them and what's actually happening, the expression estrogen dominance is one that's used most commonly. At this time, your ovaries are both a hormone factory and an egg factory. Perimenopause is that time when both fertility and hormonal balance are inconsistent and unpredictable. I have to put a warning note out at this point. Pregnancy is still possible during this phase. Not only is it possible, additionally, it's a higher risk of the possibility of having twins. The erratic behavior of the follicles that release multiple eggs during this time can result in multiple ovulation. So if you're talking to any perimenopausal lady in the clinics, ideally you want to cover the issue of birth control because it is a must during the perimenopausal phase. The third and common phase that, again, most of people are talking about and understanding in relation to menopause is the actual phrase menopause. Menopause is actually one day in the female life. And it's the day that is recognized whenever you have understood that it has been 12 consecutive months since you last had a period. And when that day occurs, that is your one day of menopause. Following that, you then become postmenopausal. So postmenopause refers to the time when menopause has been fully established. And as I said, it's defined by the complete absence of periods for a full 12 month period. Now I do have a lot of ladies who come to me and say, I haven't had a period for 10 months. Am I postmenopausal? No, because what can still happen even in that phase of perimenopause is that they might miss periods for eight, nine or 10 months and then five or six weeks later, have another period, in which case they have another full 12 months to wait without any periods whatsoever between the point of knowing that they could still be fertile and that they are then completely infertile. So that I know for some ladies is really frustrating, but it's very important to understand it's a full 12 months without any periods whatsoever. And then they are postmenopausal. Postmenopausal is all about estrogen and the absence of it. Your ovaries have now gone out of action. Pregnancy is no longer available. And about two years after becoming postmenopausal, 
most women notice a drop in their testosterone levels. And generally it shows as abnormal hair growth on the face, loss of eyebrows, um, loss of hair on the head, thinning of the hair in their scalp, um, changes of the bodily hair in other areas of their body. What they also will notice because they've had that testosterone imbalance, they've got a higher testosterone level, as well as the everything else dropping, the imbalances of testosterone, they then find that they grow hair in areas that they don't really want to have. So what we find is that you will very often see in a postmenopausal woman, um, abnormal growth of hair on the face, um, on the legs, and the back of the hands for some of them. Um, so it's a very distressing time when, when our patients and female patients notice this is actually happening. Um, it just reminds them that the aging process is actually catching up with them. And that's not something that anybody really likes to discuss, um, certainly not in this day and age. Um, the other thing that most women will know at this period of time is that they have a drop in their libido their sexual desire has disappeared and they will have an increase in vaginal atrophy. So the tissue of the vagina becomes much thinner and painful. Um, regardless of what age you achieve postmenopause, the one thing that you need to understand is that you will remain postmenopausal for the rest of your life. So what are the signs and symptoms of menopause? There are many indicators that the process of menopause has begun. And even though it's inevitable, menopause is still a shock to your body. Your brain, your heart, your bones, joints, your skin, your hair, vagina, your bladder and breasts all feel the crunch. The order and extent and inconvenience of these symptoms will vary greatly from one woman to another. There are a lot of symptoms involved in menopause. Not everyone will have them all. Not everyone will have all of them at the same time. Not every woman has symptoms of menopause. There are some who sail through it without experiencing any of the symptoms whatsoever. But there are some very common ones that you will be familiar with that is commonly associated and joked about for menopausal women. The number one um, symptom that most people will find they become familiar with is a change in their menstrual cycle. So most people will find that they start missing periods, that they have periods that they will have gap in for a much longer and extended period of time, and then they'll have another period. And that can go on for many years, but that tends to be one of the initial indications that your body is starting to trans, you know, change and go into that menopausal phase. So the second common um, symptom that most people talk about are hot flushes. For those of you who don't know, hot flushes are when, when ladies complain of sudden surges of heat. Some people explain it like a volcano that just suddenly erupts from their body. And they get really extreme redness either from their chest upwards or it takes them all the way up to their head. Some people will have extreme hot flushing when they will suddenly just drip water. And for some people, it looks like they just literally come out of a shower. Um, it can have any combination, um, that symptom can have any combination of those experiences. Um, it's exacerbated for a lot of people if they are heavy smokers, if they are heavy drinkers, and if their diet is not adequately balanced. With um, hot flushes, most commonly the ladies that are experiencing the hot flushes will also have night sweats. Now, night sweats are pretty dramatic for anybody who's actually suffered them. When you go to bed at night, you might still up being quite cool and comfortable, and then you can suddenly wake up in the middle of the night, need to throw your duvet off because you're having hot flush, and very commonly at the same time, you will have a full night sweat. So for some ladies, that can mean that they will be changing their bedclothes and their nightwear, and generally kicking their husbands or partners out of bed two or three times every night as it continues, unless they get some remedy for it or some um, help in some way to reduce the, the constant attack of their hot flushes and night sweats. It's a very debilitating symptom for those of you who've experienced it and for people who have been through it. With that comes insomnia. 
Now, even if you're not suffering from night sweats, insomnia is a very common symptom in menopause. And if any of you have experienced it, you will know you either can't get to sleep or you fall asleep and you wake at two or three o'clock in the morning and you may or may not be able to get back to sleep or you will sleep through till three or four o'clock in the morning. And most women I know who suffer from that sort of insomnia just get up and get on with their day. So one key indicator of that, I always think it's quite funny for those of us who suffered from insomnia and the, the waking at four o'clock in the mornings, we're the people you get the emails from at five and 5.30 in the morning. So if you know any of your friends who are sending you emails at that time, generally it's because they're going through a menopause state and they have nothing better to do but kick onto their emails. Obviously, a side effect of hot flushes, night sweats, insomnia is chronic fatigue during the daytime. If you haven't slept properly and your body hasn't had the opportunity to go through its natural cleanup process whilst you're sleeping, you're waking in the morning and by 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, absolutely exhausted. This is a problem for menopausal women, particularly because what most of us tend to do whenever you're exhausted at that period of the morning is to have something that's very highly carbohydrate. When you eat that, you're then sparking an insulin response in your body. So at the same time as putting on some extra weight, particularly around your midsection, you're fueling it with the eating patterns that you're having because of your hot sweats, your night flushes, and your carbohydrate levels dropping. Those tend to go hand in hand. So with that comes forgetfulness. I'm sure you've all experienced some female who's forgetful. Mood swings are another very common symptom of menopause. And I'm sure if you've met any menopausal women again, you know that you can be happy and smiling one minute and the next breath you're weeping and crying and everything is dreadful. So with that again comes irritability and depression. So all of the, the mental associates of menopause come under the headings of mood swings, irritability and depression. It's not uncommon for a woman to go to a GP and the first course of action to help her will be um, a prescription from some antidepressants, which can, we know, ease some of these early symptoms of perimenopause. I mentioned the carbohydrate um, cravings. It's very common for menopausal women, especially to crave carbohydrates, sweets and alcohol. And that's all to do with our huge fluctuations in our blood sugar, our insulin levels constantly peaking and dropping the whole time. The other thing that a lot of ladies are concerned about when they go into menopause, that perimenopausal stage, is what happens to their breasts. Like puberty, and again, we're talking about puberty in reverse, the very, very similar consequences. When you go into puberty, you get breast pain. When you go into perimenopause and menopausal stages, you also get breast pain, but for a different reason. But what we also find in menopause, not only do you get breast pain, but you get growth to your breasts. So for those of you who have maybe experienced that, it's quite an interesting um, side effect of your menopause that you'll find your breasts get larger. Um, but that's part of the dropping of your estrogen and progesterone levels. Another common side effect is joint stiffness. Commonly, a lot of ladies these days um, in the perimenopausal, space, the perimenopausal phase will complain of wrist pain and shoulder pain specifically. Wrist pain, we find, is generally something that's also associated with repetitive strain injury or rest stress. In the last nine months, I've seen a lot of my patients complaining about this a lot more, mostly because they're sitting in front of the computer, so they're doing a lot more pressure on the, these short, small joints. But again, that's due to a decrease of estrogen and progesterone. Dry skin. Now, for those of you who are working within the aesthetics arena, dry skin in menopausal ladies is a very depressing feature. I've met lots of ladies who actually don't care too much about what's happening in the rest of their menopause, but when it affects their skin, especially on their face and arms, then it becomes a real issue for it. Now, what we find is for women, especially in the menopausal phase, that the dry skin we know is due to the decrease of estrogen and progesterone, and also the loss and redistribution of the fat pads, particularly in the lower area of the face. 
Now we know that we have got lots of tools within our armory that we can help that. We can do some dermal fillers for them. We can do volume enhancement for them. We can give um, neuromodulators to relax the fine lines in other areas. But if we don't address the quality of the skin tissue, then we're injecting into the equivalent of a Pirelli tile. Because the one thing that happens, particularly to a menopausal skin, is that it becomes harder. And that's called glycogen. It's because the skin tissue has too much sugar in it and loses its mobility. So skin care and using the right skin products for a menopausal skin become hugely important and very relevant in our medical aesthetic practices. Again, something that you'll probably find that the same lady is complaining about is hair loss, particularly on the scalp. Now we know that hair loss um, comes in various forms. And for some menopausal ladies, they will find they have in the front area, just in these fine areas around the scalp area. And for some other ones, they find they have male pattern baldness, which ends up with this very thin hairline. And you can see right through the scalp on the top of the scalp. Again, if you are working within the aesthetics arena, there are many tools that can be actually used to address the hair loss on the scalp. So it's very important, again, from a self-esteem point of view for the female, that you address that because it's a huge indicator of a loss of femininity. Again, hair growth in undesirable places, you will find that, as I mentioned before, ladies tend to grow hair on their faces. They lose it where they don't want it, and it comes to places where it's just not talked about, quite honestly. But it's, again, very important and very much within the umbrella of the aesthetics industry to deal with these ladies on this level, if not on the hormone level. The other area that's that's difficult for a lot of ladies to talk about, but is very important for their intimate sexual health and well-being and for their well-being in general, is vaginal dryness and urinary tract infections. What we know is the vagina is a muscle. And like any other muscle in menopause, when it's not being stimulated or exercised, it becomes thinner and drier. So for some ladies who ignore this, they can get to the point where the internal vaginal wall tissue actually connects um, and obviously is a very painful situation for them. We have the ability, again, under our umbrella of aesthetics to deal with that in several ways. So a lot of you I know will have um, machines and uh, laser machines that will be able to address the vaginal uh, fluidity and contraction of um, the vaginal muscle and we also have some products that we are very able to use as continuity have vaginal rejuvenation treatments which we know that um, are very good for vaginal atrophy and for vaginal dryness and um, if you're not already using those whenever we're not able to be open so much these are something that you can prescribe for your patients that they can use and will get great benefit from at home. Urinary incontinence Again, because the area of tissue is shrinking and drying out, most ladies find they have much more incidence of urinary tract infections, which can become quite chronic if not dealt with um, properly, effectively and quickly. The one thing that every woman I know going through menopause wants to talk about or cry about or scream about is weight gain. Sadly and unfortunately, it is one of the side effects of a loss of estrogen and progesterone within the female body. Female bodies are designed to have estrogen to keep us alive and well and healthy for a very long time. When our estrogen starts dropping from our ovaries, our bodies have been very cleverly designed as females, and we have a secondary reserve of estrogen cells within our abdominal fat. So when our ovaries stop functioning, we have much less estrogen being produced from the ovaries, our secondary um, estrogen cells start activating and we get that extra fat around the middle. So you find you lose some of the fat on your hips or thighs and that sits around the middle. It's all part of your body trying to protect itself. Well, whilst that's lovely, it's not something that you want. But in terms of weight gain, what I would suggest to you, every female who's listening, is to remember some very core cool things. One, we're not just women with uteruses. We are completely different. We function in a different way. We have a cycle and rhythm that dominates our hormones from the age of puberty. 
And even though you may be in a menopausal state, you still have some fluctuation within that 28 day cycle. So trying to follow a diet or exercise plan that is designed for a man will mean that you find that you're constantly saying it didn't work. I didn't lose weight on it. Um, I put weight on. This didn't work. And I, there's no woman I've met in my practice that hasn't been on five or six or more diets trying to lose weight. And until the understanding comes that, first of all, you have to realign and balance the hormones before you can have any significant change in your body shape or your weight loss, predominantly because we are women and not men. Decreased sex drive, again, comes with the dryness of the vagina and the loss of testosterone. And it is a problem for menopausal women. They still want to have an ex extra active sex life. So you've got to talk about that and deal predominantly with their um, with the atrophy of the vagina, but also if they need to have some supplementation with some HRT or bioidentical hormones or um, supplements in some way to try and get that back for them. One other thing, again, that a lot of menopausal women find is that they develop acne, which very much comes under that skin problem situation. And again, that's the imbalance between the estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. So that tends to show you when, when somebody is testosterone um, dominant because it, you, you get that acne that looks like you're a boy. So you know that that's when that's balancing out. Um, and headaches are very commonly popular as well. A lot of it tends to be actually because of dehydration, because we still find it very difficult to drink enough water. So those are the most common ones. I mean, there are up to 34 signs and symptoms of menopause, but, but those are the ones that most commonly are talked about. So in essence, the key to success in progressing through and managing menopause is to use principles in analysing your issues and then making some choices. You know yourself better than anyone else does. And in making management choices for you and your menopause to deal with you and your menopause in the best way for you. What you need to do is to balance the benefits of each of the options against the risks of each of the other options. And once you've collated your information, then you can make the choice that's best for you at that time. Now, the other thing to remember is it will change what, what suits you for three to six months may not suit you for the next three to six months. So you have to be able to be quite fluid as you're sort of transversing through that period of menopause. So I hope that's given you an overview of uh, the history of menopause, what it is, the common features to look out for, the common symptoms to look out for, and a little bit of background of what can be done. I haven't touched on HRT or bioidentical hormones because those are I would be here the rest of the day. And there's lots of other really nice speakers coming along after me. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Georgia. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was really interesting. Um, and we've had a few people comment to say they found that really insightful. Um, what we're going to do, I think we're going to hop on over to the Aesthetic Practice Networking Lounge. Um, okay. And then we'll take any more questions we've got from you, Deborah. People can ask you directly. Um, and there's a few things that I wanted to ask. Um, so for everyone watching, just to let you know how to access the Aesthetic Practice Networking Lounge, if you click back into the Conferences tab along the, um, the top navigation bar, uh, click into Aesthetic Practice again, and then scroll down and you'll see under Lounges, there's the Aesthetic Practice Lounge. So if anyone wants to hop over there, um, and Deborah, if you are okay to join us as well, then we sure. can um, we can have a, a bit of discussion if anyone's got any questions. But thank you, that was brilliant. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll see you over there in a second. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.